Uh, Mr. Baldry. Uh, my Lords, uh, in this matter, I appear for the revenue uh, with Ms. Belgrano and Mr. Wilmot Smith, and the respondent to the payment, uh, Jaztel, is represented by Mr. Grosinski and Mr. Jones. Uh, I hope that the court will have received uh, the correct uh, bundles, which would be a core bundle, uh, a short supplementary bundle uh, for the appeal hearing and two uh, authorities bundles uh, and in addition to that uh, there should be three additional bundles containing uh, unagreed uh, documents which are the subject of, of two respective applications. Uh, I'll, I'll come on to those yep. uh, in due course. Uh, as you'll have seen this is an appeal uh, from a decision of Mr Justice Marcus Smith uh, given on the 3rd of April 2017 um, on the trial of a claim for restitution uh, of stamp duty reserve tax paid by JASTEL uh, for the revenue, uh, JASTEL's claim uh, had been designated as the test claim uh, for certain uh, limitation issues uh, and other issues identified in the stamp taxes group uh, litigation order. Uh, that uh, GLO uh, was made on the 21st of October uh, 2010, and it governs uh, a number of claims against the revenue for restitution uh, and or damages uh, in respect of stamp duty reserve tax or stamp duty uh, charged uh, in relation to the issue of shares, in particular uh, the issue of shares to a clearance service uh, or to a depository, where those claims are based on uh, EU uh, directly effective rights. Um, and you will have seen that the underlying dispute uh, concerns a claim made by JASTEL uh, for the repayment of SDRT, uh, which was charged uh, inconsistently with EU law, so it falls within the GLO. And the issues in this appeal uh, concern whether JASTEL's claim uh, to recover the tax it paid uh, by mistake are out of time uh, under the provisions of the uh, Limitation Act uh, 1980. Uh, and these are all rights uh, which accrued under the UK's membership of the EU, uh, so uh, no issues arise due to the UK having now left. Uh, and there are two main issues. Uh, the first concerns Section 320 of the Finance Act uh, 2004, uh, and whether that section had the effect of disapplying uh, Section 321C of the Limitation Act 1980 the circumstances of Jazztel's claim. Uh, that's one of the issues below and the, an issue in which the revenue has permission. Uh, the second issue, uh, which arises from the decision of the Supreme Court, uh, the latest decision of the Supreme Court in the, uh, the FII um, proceedings, um, is whether uh, Jazztel's claim is in time under the provisions of Section 321C. Uh, which turns on when the mistake uh, which Jazztel uh, asserts it made uh, was discoverable. Uh, and that is uh, an issue that wasn't argued below, and it's the subject of an application uh, by the revenue to amend their, their grounds. Uh, and I'll come to that uh, in due course. I hope you've received a timetable yes, uh, from, from the much. parties, which, which shows that um, I'm proposing to uh, take <coughs> Section 320 first. Yes. Um, uh, and sort of the thinking behind that is that that was the issue that was dealt with by the learned judge, uh, and the court will wish to address his reasoning regardless of Section 321C. Uh, and, and strictly, if uh, the revenue are correct that Section uh, 320 does apply uh, in this claim, uh, then Section 321C is disapplied. Uh, so um, strictly, it does not arise, but. Um, I, we would point out that uh, the decision, there is an overlap uh, between um, the, the effect of Section 321C uh, and um, the judge's reasoning on Section 320 it, itself. Um, the judge's reading uh, proceeded on the assumption, on the footing, uh, that uh, JASTEL was entitled uh, to and bring its claims under an extended limitation period running from the date of the uh, decision in uh, 
think he thought it was the Advocate General's opinion in the HSBC uh, case, uh, whereas um, uh, on, on the revenues, uh, and uh, on the judge's assumption, that extended limitation period was curtailed by Section 320, uh, whereas on the revenues, a uh, new way of seeing things, that assumption may not be sound. Yeah. Um, the, the judge um, briefly summarized the relevant domestic regime uh, at paragraphs one to seven of his judgment. Now, um, unlike some of the other uh, tax-related GLOs, this is not a case where the, um, the, the, the domestic legislation throws up all sorts of difficult issues which need to be sort of grappled with before um, uh, one, one has to work out how to apply <coughs> EU law. But, but nevertheless, uh, the background to the, um, the decision in the um, HSBC case uh, is, is relevant because it forms the, um, the basic um, um, cause of action that uh, is relied on by JASTEL. So if I can take you briefly through the, uh, the relevant domestic regime as summarized by the, the learned judge, that's in the core bundle at tab 9. <coughs> and in hard copy, it's page uh, 99. Uh, and um, I'm not sure whether uh, you, you will all be using the, the hard copy. I'm, I'm afraid I will be using the hard copy. I'm not sure about it. I will be yes, as well. Good. <laughs> yes, that's excellent. I, I, otherwise, I would have always been having to add uh, certain numbers onto the page. <laughs> so, um, uh, page 99 uh, of the core bundle. Uh, and stamp duty reserve tax is um, probably the most interesting case that stamp duty reserve tax has <laughs> <laughs> ever, ever made its appearance. Um, but the, the learned judge sets out the basic regime of there being uh, a, a general rule that SDRT is charged at uh, half a percent um, <clears throat> on agreements to transfer chargeable securities, um, shares in uh, in, in companies fall within that. Uh, but in two cases, um, there was a higher rate of 1.5% charged. Uh, and this was where, at first, that chargeable securities were transferred or issued uh, to a clearance house, uh, Section 96 of the Finance Act 1986. And secondly, chargeable securities issued or transferred uh, in exchange for a depository uh, receipt more appropriated towards satisfaction of a depository receipt holder's right uh, to obtain chargeable securities under a depository receipt arrangement. And that was section 93. Um, chargeable securities covers uh, shares issued by uh, UK companies. Clearance service operated by a clearance house uh, is a, an arrangement for settling uh, transactions in securities. Uh, and the important point about that is that once in the system, once shares have been issued uh, to a clearance house, uh, securities can be traded uh, without the need for a transfer uh, document and no SDRT is payable. Uh, so the higher 1.5% uh, charge is applied uh, to the issue into the uh, clearance system uh, precisely because no SDRT is chargeable um, on subsequent transfers within that system. That's the, the logic of the system. It was sometimes referred to as a, as a season ticket, um, uh, sort of assuming that the, there would be three, three transfers uh, in, the, um, uh, in the existence of the share within the clearance system. Uh, <coughs> that's that's the, the, the basic regime. And then over the page, um, page 100, the judge refers uh, to the decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, in the HSBC Holdings case uh, of 1st of October uh, 2009, which decided that the charge uh, under Section 96, uh, the, the, the issue of shares into the clearance service, was prohibited by uh, Council uh, Directive uh, 69.335-EEC, uh, known as the Capital Duty uh, Directive. Um, if I can 
take you from uh, the learned judge's uh, decision to the decision of, of the court in the HSBC case. Uh, that's in authority number two. Tab. Tab 12. decision of the 1st of October uh, 2009, uh, paragraph 3 of the decision, dealing on page uh, 491, uh, the court uh, sets out the relevant terms of the directive, and on page uh, 492, paragraph 6. Uh, they refer to Article 11 of the Directive, uh, which says uh, member states shall not subject to any form of taxation whatsoever, and then little a, uh, the creation, issue, admission to quotation on the stock exchange, making available uh, on the market or dealing in stocks, uh, shares, or other securities of the same type, or the certificates representing uh, such securities by whomsoever issued. Uh, so on the face of it, uh, there was a, a prohibition of imposing tax on the issue uh, of shares. Uh, however, paragraph uh, 7 records that under Article 12.1a of the directive, uh, the member states uh, may, notwithstanding Articles 10 and 11, charge duties on the transfer of securities, whether at a flat rate or not. So, the UK's general regime of transferring the 0.5% uh, was permitted, um, uh, and the, uh, the United Kingdom's argument in the HSBC uh, case was that it's a, Article 12 effectively permitted uh, the taxation uh, of um, the issue of the shares at the 1.5% rate because it was intended to be a season. Uh, and that argument was, was rejected uh, by the, uh, the Court of Justice uh, quite briefly. The Court deals with uh, uh, the issue that was referred, which essentially uh, was the, uh, the UK charge um, prohibited by Article 11. Uh, from paragraphs 29 onwards, 502, 503. And uh, the paragraphs 29 to, uh, to 33, uh, they essentially say that the, the charge imposed by section 96 is prohibited by article 11 because it is a tax charge on the issue of securities, uh, and the, the United Kingdom's point that uh, it was a season ticket couldn't overcome the basic objection that the, the tax uh, was a charge on the issue of, of securities. Um, I believe that's picked up at paragraph uh, 34. Uh, so um, in light of that, uh, the charge uh, on the issue of, of shares to a clearance service was expressly held to be uh, contrary to the capital duties directive, uh, and in light of the reasoning uh, that uh, the court had adopted, uh, namely that um, uh, this, uh, this, this provision does apply uh, to issues of shares, uh, it was confirmed to be act clear in a subsequent um, decision of the FTT um, that um, uh, that reasoning also applied to section 93, the issue of shares to a, a depository. So um, that, that provides us a, the, the, the legal background uh, to the SDRT regime. So turning to, to Jastel's claim, um, if I can just sort of remind you of the, sort of the, the key dates to have in mind before we 
Now we're going to look at the, the cases. JazzTel uh, was a, a UK PLC, uh, which in the period from 2000 to 2008 undertook a series of, of sh share issues, uh, issues into clearance services, uh, on which SDRT was paid. Uh, there was a total of, of 23 uh, payments, and they're set out in a, in a helpful table at paragraph 23 uh, of, of the judgment. Uh, so we put away the authorities bundle, and if I can take you to the, uh, the judge's decision, call uh, bundle, nine. Page 107. Um, and these are payments that uh, JazzTel made that the, the learner judge found were all made uh, by mistake. Uh, starting from 2000, going on till 7th of May uh, 2008, uh, which is the last payment. Uh, of, of SDRT in dispute that uh, JazzTel made uh, and as you may have seen from uh, the judgment that uh, following the decision of the Advocate General uh, in the HSBC case which was uh, delivered on the 18th of March 2009 um, JazzTel adopted a, a different approach uh, as I'll take you to and it thereafter refused to make payments of SDRT uh, and notified um, the revenue uh, accordingly. So um, the decision of the, of the Court of Justice was in 1st of October 2009. Uh, in December 2009, uh, JazzTel then made a claim uh, for repayment of sums paid relying on the judgment. Now, that wasn't a high court claim. That was simply a letter uh, to the to the revenue, um, saying that we'd paid 3.3 uh, million um, under, but under the statutory scheme uh, for repay for claiming repayments uh, of SDRT, there was a six-year uh, time. Uh, and uh, the judge um, notes that um, the the repayment claim. Uh, covered uh, periods only going back six years. So that's at paragraph 10, uh, C, little c of the judgment on uh, page 101, where the judge recalled that Jazdell made a claim under Regulation 14 uh, in the amount of some £3.3 million pounds in respect of SDRT paid on issues of shares to clearance services for the period December 2003 uh, to May 2008. <coughs> All those payments were within the limitation uh, period then uh, applicable. Uh, so that's the, the limitation period that applied to uh, claims under, under the statutory uh, regime. Uh, and the revenue paid out on uh, those, those claims. Uh, so that was the, the statutory claim made by the uh, by the company Jazztel, uh, and then it's some three years later uh, that they bring their High Court claim. That's on the 19th uh, of December uh, 2013, um, and the claim forms at uh, tab uh, 11 of, of the core bundle. <coughs> um, the, um, the there's. A relationship between the, the statutory claims that are being made and the, uh, the, the GLO, the HSBC reference, uh, arose in the, in the context of a, of a statutory repayment claim. Uh, HSBC had uh, paid SDRT in, in 2000. Uh, it had made a statutory claim uh, to the revenue for re repayment of a uh, rather greater sum, I think it was um, uh, over 20 million uh, in that case. Uh, and the, um, that claim had been disputed by the revenue. It went to the first tier tribunal, and the first tier tribunal uh, referred the question to the um, Court of Justice um, at the end of uh, 
2007. Um, but in addition to the uh, HSBC's statutory claim uh, and JASTEL statutory claims, uh, HSBC and a number of other companies brought claims in the High Court uh, seeking restitution uh, and or damages uh, against the revenue in order to recover um, amounts, either amounts charged um, by way of SDRT and in particular compound interest uh, on those uh, on those amounts. Uh, and as the judge records at paragraph 11 of uh, his, his judgment um, that there were there were sort of perceived advantages uh, of bringing high court claims as opposed to uh, the statutory uh, claims. Uh, in particular, uh, the possibility of getting a compound interest. Uh, and, of course, limitation. Mm. <coughs> um, part of the reason for bringing your high court claim is to obtain the advantage of the limitation period under Section 32.1c. And um, the decision of the House of Lords in the Deutsche Morgan Grenfell case uh, in October uh, 2006 uh, had established two important points relevant to these types of claims. Uh, first, that a taxpayer who paid a tax uh, by mistake uh, was entitled to rely on the ordinary general uh, common law right to recover monies paid by mistake. It wasn't excluded uh, from that um, ordinary regime uh, by implication or otherwise. Uh, and secondly, that um, where tax had been paid by mistake, uh, under a tax charge which had been sort of subsequently held to be unlawful by some final uh, judicial decision, uh, then the taxpayer was entitled to bring the mistake-based claim against the revenue, uh, and that the effect of Section 32.1c was that the six-year uh, limitation period uh, would run from the date of that final judicial uh, decision. And I'll, I'll um, look at that reasoning when we look at the, uh, the, the latest decision in the FII case. Uh, but in, in reaching uh, this decision, uh, the House of Lords had overturned the decision of the, of the Court of Appeal and upheld the decision of, of the first instance judge, uh, Mr. Justice Park, uh, which had been given in on the 18th of July 2003, uh, and that um, that is relevant. That background is relevant uh, to the introduction of Section 320, uh, and the, the the judge summarizes uh, the, the relevance uh, by quoting uh, a decision of uh, Mr. Justice Henderson, as he then was in, in the FII case, uh, which is uh, summarized at paragraph 71 of the the judgment on page 132. <coughs> it was that combination of section 321C and the ability to claim compound interest which made the whole thing such a catastrophe from the revenue's perspective in, in, in monetary fact, terms if nothing else. Yes, there, there are two sea changes of, the, of yeah. uh, the law of restitution which um, um, left potentially a, a door open. With claims going back to 1973 and therefore including all the decades of terribly high inflation in the 90, well, anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, yes, because be before that um, we'd had the, the Woolwich claim had, mm. had established that uh, taxpayers had a, a right to claim uh, tax back under the common law, um, uh, but um, uh, that was subject to a six-year time limit. Um, as we've we'll come, come to see, the, the position has been regularised now um, in, because um, in 2009... Slightly loaded Act, way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, the, in the 2009 Finance Act, the, for corporation tax purposes, um, Parliament 
enacted that the statutory regime was the exclusive regime. And, and for domestic law purposes, it, 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 had, it had been. I mean, for, for domestic law purposes, the courts had, had held that um, uh, if, you had a, uh, if you had a right, a, a remedy under the Taxes Act, uh, then that was your, that was your remedy. Mm. The, the decision of the Court of William and Monroe, it was, it was the 32-1C BMG together with uh, EU law. Difficulties. Um, <coughs> so that that is the the background to, to section thirty uh, section three twenty uh, as uh, as as uh, was explained in the uh, the FII High Court uh, decision. Mr. Baldry, can I just ask you? Has anyone suggested that the statutory scheme, the, the time limit in the statutory scheme, uh, is incompatible with community law? No. The the uh, the, the time limit in the in the statutory scheme was uh, six six years at the time, and it's quite clear as a matter of sort of uh, EU law that the general position is that uh, uh, procedural matters such as time limits mm. are left to the procedural autonomy of the member states, right. uh, and so the member state is is free uh, to impose whatever time limit it chooses to. Uh, subject only to the principles of equivalence and effectiveness, which we'll come on to. But there's absolutely no doubt that if you have a, a, a general time limit, as all member states uh, do, uh, then you're entitled to, yeah. member states are entitled to rely on that. So the only so. issues arise is if, um, if you shorten them, does that, uh, does that cause circumstances yeah. where it's practically impossible or excessively difficult for the taxpayer to bring their yeah. claim? So there's nothing wrong in principle, you say in a state having, for example, a six-year time limit for restitutionary claims. And, and the fact that somebody, in fact, is in a position where their course of action accrued 10 years ago, and they can't claim for that, <coughs> that's just tough. Yes, that is absolutely clear that, mm. that that's, that's what the, the, the case law says. And, 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 and questions of knowledge don't come into it, as I understand it. No. Um, I'll, 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 there are sort of three, three sort of main cases, Marks and Spencer, Grundy, and the, um, a case on Section 320 itself, um, because Section 320 did have the effect of removing some taxpayers' <coughs> accrued rights uh, in, as um, uh, Lord Justice Lewison said in the Lees case, it, they, they, they went in a puff of smoke on the day that Section 320 <coughs> was announced, uh, but that's not our case. So section uh, 320, uh, can I take it that you, 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 you will read the, the background? Yeah, I, I should say we, we've all read extensively, I think. Yeah. Uh, you may, may think I'm taking it too far, but I think... No, 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 it's, it's helpful, Mr. Baldry. Um, uh, I was but uh, uh, you can be reassured we have read a lot. Yeah, okay. I, 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 I had assumed that, so I, I did take that quite briefly, that that was sort of the resume of the... Uh, of most of the background, yes, mm. uh, and I was going to take you to section 320 it, itself yes. uh, now. Uh, it's in authority bundle two. Uh, well, perhaps show you first section 321C, of course, we uh, well familiar with just in this. Context 32.1c is on page uh, 560, tab 16. <coughs> uh, so, in the in the case of where the action is for a relief from the consequences of a mistake, uh, the period of limitation shall not begin to run until the plaintiff has discovered the mistake, uh, or could, with reasonable diligence, have discovered it. Uh, and section 320. Uh, is over the page, over the tab 17, page 563, uh, and it provides that uh, section 32.1c of the Limitation Act uh, 1980 uh, does not apply in relation to a mistake of law relating to a taxation matter under the care and management of the Commissioners of Inland Revenue. 
this subsection has effect in relation to actions brought on or after 8th of September uh, 2003, and um, as was explained in the, in the actual background um, uh, explanation, that was the, the date when um, it was announced uh, in, in Parliament. I can't remember, had the idea that you needed a transitional period already been raised by this point? I mean, if it had, it seems quite surprising that Parliament didn't provide for one. Um, it, it, it was um, uh, a, a, a period in which the, um, uh, the, the final outcome of all this had not been determined, but no. um, uh, there was a, maybe, you know, say, looking back on it, the writing was on the wall. So section um, 320 then uh, potentially applies to claims based on mistake which were made in light of the um, HSBC litigation. Uh, and so two questions concerning section 320 were accordingly added to the common issues of law um, stated in the, uh, the GLO issues. Um, and um, if you um, if you have those in mind, I won't take you uh, to them, but the um, the, 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 the GLO is in the uh, supplementary bundle uh, at, at tab 9 uh, and there are two questions which, which def differentiate uh, between um, whether the SDRT was paid uh, before or after um, 8th of September uh, 2001 uh, it being perceived that uh, the answer may be different if a taxpayer uh, had paid SDRT under one regime, Section 320 then changes uh, the, the time period uh, as opposed to another situation where the tax is actually paid mm. afterwards. So at the time you make the payment, uh, the, the, the law is there in front of you. Uh, and um, as, as you'll have seen, that actually that distinction uh, was resolved. Um, uh, in, in the revenues favour insofar as it concerns payments after 8th of September uh, 2003 uh, by the decision in the, uh, in the Leeds Council case which is, which is in the bundle. Um, the, the, reason, the underlying reasoning uh, of, uh, of the Court of Appeal in that case was looking at, um, okay, suppose you had a, a payment that was made the day after uh, the change in the law the real question is, does, the, tax, does the, the payer have an adequate period of time in which to bring their, their claim? Um, the vice of a retrospective uh, change to a limitation period is that a claimant's claim may go up in a puff of smoke. And so that's the distinction being drawn if the payment is made on the 9th of September. Uh, and you say that practical considerations and reality is that the same uh, considerations apply if the um, uh, if, if the tax is paid on the seventh of September. Um, so that's that's the main background uh, to, to the case which the judge was against, which the judge was required to decide um, the three twenty issue uh, before him. One aspect of the background I haven't covered is change of position um, uh, in the sense that the, uh, this case was sort of following on behind uh, the, the, the larger FII uh, pr proceedings and uh, at, the, at the time of the, um, of, of the High Court hearing, uh, the, the revenue had lost change of position in the Court of Appeal. So there was a decision positively against them at the Court of Appeal level uh, that were proposing to um, uh, appeal that uh, decision to the, to the Supreme Court uh, and therefore the, the judge adopted the sort of unusual and he, he wasn't particularly comfortable with it that um, uh, in, in practical terms seemed the best thing to do that we, we heard the evidence on uh, a change of position uh, but um, uh, as things turned out change of position appeal was dropped by the revenue and so that has fallen fallen away completely um, 
So um, in light of, of that background, I can come to the, uh, the, the judge's decision on the, the points before you uh, and our um, grounds of appeal. Um, the, the judge decided um, that Jasdell had made uh, mistakes uh, when uh, made the payments of SVRT uh, in question. Uh, and he held that the application of Section 320 uh, to Jansdell's claim, which um, uh, removed the um, right to rely on Section 32.1c, uh, that application would offend the principle of effectiveness. Uh, and therefore, he held that the section was to be disapplied uh, so that Jansdell was to um, be, be entitled to rely on Section 32.1c. Uh, as I said, that the, the judge's reasoning on section 320 um, was essentially that the effect of introducing section 320 was to remove uh, the um, limitation period under section 321c, which JASTA would otherwise have enjoyed, um, and that retrospectively taking away that um, longer potentially long limitation period uh, was, the, was the feature that made it contrary to EU law. Um, so that assumption, we say, now uh, uh, can't be safely made in the light of the uh, decision in um, FII, but we say that even assuming that the judge would otherwise have been, that, 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 um, that JASTEL would otherwise have been entitled to rely on Section 32.1c, uh, then the shortening of the limitation period by Parliament saying that these actions are now subject to a six-year time limit uh, did not offend EU law. Um, uh, because we say that the effect in this case of imposing the six-year limitation period was on the facts of Janstel's case uh, was that on the um, 8th of September 2003, uh, JASTEL had three years under the then new limitation period fixed uh, clearly by Section uh, 320 uh, in which to bring its earliest claim uh, in the present case, which was in uh, 2000. It might, it might be said that's a matter of happenstance. I mean, don't we have to consider the compatibility of a member state's legislation with EU law? at the level of principle. So there may be hypothetical cases where, for example, somebody's completely lost their cause of action as a result of this new legislation coming in. But, but absolutely, yes. We, we, we do have to look at Section 320 uh, as a matter of principle. And mm. the critical question is, uh, how, how far is the court required to disapply Section 320? Is it required? To disapply it completely for all for all taxpayers um, in all circumstances, or as we say, and which we say were supported by the decisions of the Court of Justice, is the court required to disapply Section 320 in so far as it does offend the principle of effectiveness? In other words, in so far as in any particular case, it it takes away taxpayers' rights to reclaim tax in circumstances where that makes the taxpayer's position uh, excessively difficult or <coughs> practically impossible to bring their claim. So we, and we say that what the court has said um, in the Grundig case is that um, the principle of effectiveness does require uh, the court to disapply Section 320 where um, its effect is to make a claimant's uh, rights to exercise their the ability to exercise their EU rights practically impossible or excessively difficult. But that does not mean that the new time limit is thereafter to be completely disapplied in all circumstances for everybody. So it turns on whether the um, the, the introduction of Section 320 does offend the principle of effectiveness. And we 
know that Section 320 can have that effect because that was the effect of the um, CJEU's decision in um, the FII case <coughs> on 320. But that concerned um, a, a, a taxpayer called Aegis who brought their claim on the 8th of September uh, 2003 uh, and who and the effect of Section uh, 320 was that all the claims that Aegis had under Section 321C on the 7th of September 2003 went up in a puff of smoke. So the effect of bringing in 320 was that uh, the claimant in, in that case lost their right. They lost their right to make a mistake claim. But in our case, and in many other cases, the taxpayers do not lose their right to, have right. A, to, to bring their mistake claim on the 8th of September. They still have that right. And they still have a reasonable limitation period in which to bring their claim. In the Janstall case, three years. So we say it does, it's not an all or nothing uh, striking down of Section 320 that is required by, by EU law. So if I've understood it correctly, there are, so to speak, three um, bands to, con to consider. Um, if a payment is made in October 2003, I don't think it's suggested anymore that that uh, can be um, tested by reference to Section 32. It's simply the six-year time limit. That's the effect of the, the Leeds decision. Well, I think my, my, my friends sort of hold their, wish to uh, hold their position so, uh, open. Oh, oh I see. Effect. Yes, I follow. Um, holding the ring until the Supreme Court, if we ever get there. Yeah, I follow. Mm -hmm. um, so for <coughs> present purposes, at least, um, payment made in uh, um, October 2003, it's simply the six-year time limit. If, on the other hand, a payment were made in August 1997 or earlier, you accept that there would be incompatibility uh, with EU law. Um, I don't know whether, or maybe you'll tell us what the implications of that would be. So supposing that somebody uh, had made a payment in August 1997, uh, and suppose for the sake of argument that they didn't know and couldn't reasonably have discovered that they'd made a mistake until 2009 or whatever, um, then uh, there would be some degree of disapplication. I don't. At some point, you'll probably tell us what degree of disapplication might be appropriate. But the time band with which we are really concerned is payments made between 1997 and 2003, uh, where I think Mr. Krasinski says um, it's simply Section 32. Um, forget about uh, Section 320. You say, it's not as simple as that, if you've got in effect a de facto transitional period, that's good enough. And that seems to me to be the battleground. It, it, that's exactly right. it, yes. Yeah. And, and, and as part of that, <coughs> we may have to consider whether having something which is de facto rather than de jure matters. Yes, it, 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 the question, I think it comes down to, it, it's a, a way of, of, of putting the point does does the um, does the absence of an express transitional period, um, which will have um, the wrong effect for some taxpayers, mean that the the, the, the section is just invalid uh, as a matter of as a matter of um, EU law, and so the, the UK cannot rely on it in any circumstance. Which I think is what the Jastel says, yeah. relying particularly on, on the Fleming case, but um, we'll, we'll take you to that. But, right. but we say um, uh, no, it, um, uh, it, it's a case. It is a case by case um, uh, consideration. But it does lead to a slightly odd result, doesn't it? Or perhaps you would say it's not odd. But it, it, you'd have to look at. You have to look very carefully at the facts of any particular case in order to ascertain whether. And if so, to what extent this application is is required? Whereas one sort of perhaps instinctively feels that this application, well, as the word suggests, it means you're actually saying a statutory provision is overridden by EU law and must therefore be trumped by it. 
and it's well, I, I would say that what, what's, what's essentially been left to the um, uh, to, to, to the member states to the courts mm. uh, to determine um, is what an adequate transitional period mm. <coughs> that, that, that's essentially once you've worked out and that's not on a case by case basis yeah I mean in this case we have no transitional period I mean that's yeah. absolutely zero I mean, isn't that the problem <laughs> yeah I mean, can you really get round that just by saying, well, actually, de facto, yeah. not the tax fair had um, long enough? Yeah, not not in the case of someone who's had their rights taken away from them. Not not in the case of someone who, who mm. wakes up mm. and finds that um, on, on the um, 8th of uh, September mm. that they have had their right taken away. That's clear from, from the case law. Yeah. But um, where someone wakes up on the 8th of September... <laughs> and, and finds I'm now subject to a six-year time limit and my rights haven't been uh, taken away from me because it's not excessively difficult because I didn't pay mm. Um, mm. my... Um, uh, I, I haven't got two months left. Uh, I've got three years left. Then um, all the court is needing to do is, is reach a view on what an adequate... What, what the UK regards as being an adequate yeah. transitional period. Guidance from the um, from the Court of Justice, which you know, suggests that uh, six months uh, is, is an adequate period. And the Fleming case, they said, well, it's hard to imagine that uh, you could you could require more than one year. Mm. But, you know, that if you if you if you've got if the new regime uh, gives you a year uh, in which to bring your claim under the new regime, it hasn't made your exercising your rights excessively difficult. Practically impossible. Mm. So, I mean, in this particular case, Jazz tells payments go back to 2000. Um, I think the implication of what you've just been saying uh, is that you would say that if the first payment had been made on the 1st of October 1998, then Jazz <coughs> would have had long enough. Um, suppose it had made regular payments between uh, the 1st of March. 1st of April, 1st of May, the 1st of June 1998, uh, there would be a very difficult question to decide where the cutoff was. Well, I, yeah, I think, I think the, the, but the question would be answered is that um, you, you have a look at what the regime was before, the, the, the 32-1-C regime. You have a look at the, the regime that's been um, imposed. That's what the, the court uh, has done in, in, in cases like Grundig. And say, well, in, in Grundig, it was a I think it was a three month um, in, in the context of a of a of a reduction in time from five years to three years of a limitation period in, in Italy. Um, there was ninety days period of grace uh, given under the uh, Italian regime, and, and the court said, "Well, that's not enough. You've got to take into account um, uh, the, the, the fact that um, you know, taxpayers." Need to know what to do, and, um, uh, and um, the, who knows what one has to do in, in Italy. But so there is that type of judgment. But on, on any view, on the legislation that we've got and on the authorities that we've got, uh, it is uh, twelve months maximum, six months reasonable. <coughs> I would say six months, and um, essentially um, that, that's the approach that. Um, you, you've seen that the Chancellor took in the, in the Class 8 mm. Mm. Um, uh, decision. But also, what, what, what's driving this, uh, what's driving the question is the principle of effectiveness. Uh, has, has the has the, do the national rules work so that they make it um, practically impossible Excessively difficult to bring their claim. If, 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 and to the extent they do, uh, then EU law says that offends the principle of effectiveness. But if they don't, then it's within the autonomy of the member states. Can I just take you back for a moment, Sir Baldry, to a question my lord asked earlier about disapplication? And please don't take this out of turn. But uh, as I understand it. Uh, but please correct me if I'm wrong, the courts have always used the word disapplication very carefully because 
it does appear to be something different from what might be called striking down legislation. Uh, it remains the law in this country, and, and in fact throughout our membership of the European Union, it was always the law that no court had the power to issue a quashing order in respect of an act of parliament. So even in the leading cases like Factortain, it was always a, a declaration. And, and I, I think you would say that that's why you do have to look very closely at the facts of a particular case to ask whether, on those facts, what appears to be the law is in truth not the law because it has to be disapplied to the extent of an incompatibility with the EU law. Yes, I know. And that's why you can have uh, what may at first sight be curious cases, like Hearst, and I think in the tax field there's ICI and Coleman, where the same domestic primary legislation could, depending on the facts of different cases, be applicable or not applicable. Yes, uh, uh, and, and the, the root... Uh, uh, cause of, of, of that, of, of why constitutionally we, we were in that state of affairs, was Section Two One of the European Communities Act, mm. which which says that um, uh, these provisions, the domestic law, is domestic law subject to exactly. rights under uh, under EU law, uh, and there may be occasions when EU law simply says, well, this provision is prohibited, yes. um, mm. but there are other circumstances such as. In the present case, where uh, the domestic provision is rubbing against up against the uh, a principle, uh, an EU principle, the principle mm. of effectiveness, mm. uh, and um, the principle of effectiveness has certain requirements, uh, and insofar as the, the, the domestic provision offends those requirements, then disapplication may be given. But to the extent that it doesn't, it's it's the law. And one of the problems we have is that one can find some cases, probably at very high levels, which talk about disapplication as very much as a root and branch thing. You, you, once you've disapplied a piece of legislation, it's sort of gone for all purposes. But on the other hand, there are other cases, um, some of which my Lord has referred to, I think, where disapplication is treated in a much more nuanced way as being really the minimum that's needed in order to achieve the supremacy of the relevant EU law principle over the offending domestic legislation. Uh, and and, and, and my, my submission would be that the, the balance is, is to be struck for, for the reasons my, my Lord yes. indicated, that yeah. one, one starts with a law that is the, is the law of, uh, of right. the United Kingdom, and then if and to the extent that it conflicts with the EU law, uh, it could either be given a conforming construction well, or disapplied. I was going to say on another aspect of this, I remember somehow floating this idea in various FII cases, and they never sort of gained much traction, I think. <laughs> or, or the notion being that really conforming interpretation and um, disapplication are, as it were, opposite ends of a kind of spectrum of how you deal with the question of making domestic legislation compatible with EU, EU law. And disapplication sort of begins where um, conforming interpretation becomes impossible. But it's not be wrong on this approach to treat um, disapplication as sort of radically different, striking out of a, putting a red pencil right to a provision. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and that was that was very much the approach that um, uh, Lord Walker took in the, mm. in, in the yes, in absolutely, case of noticing the, the difference between yes, um, uh, dis they are fundamentally uh, different. Well, they are fundamentally different. But um, they are, they're but seeking the same, <laughs> seeking the same goal to to, to achieve some sort of compatibility uh, with 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 EU law. Um, I think we should move um, fairly fairly quickly to the, to, to, to the authorities um, that I was proposing to um, uh, refer to on, on section uh, 3, 320. Um, and there, 
there, there have been a number of cases on, on time limits, but um, if I can take you to sort of three of them. There's the Marks and Spencers uh, case, uh, there's Grundig, and then there's um, the decision looking at Section 320 in, in the FII reference. Um, and Marks and Spencers is helpful because it sets out the, the ground rules, uh, which are then um, uh, clarified in some of the later cases. That's at Authorities Bundle 2, tab 10. It's a decision of the Court of Justice and a reference uh, from this court on the lawfulness of, of the introduction of, of a three-year uh, cap, a three-year time limit uh, for VAT claims, uh, which um, was introduced in October uh, 1996. Um, prior to October 96, the statutory uh, VAT uh, repayment remedy uh, provided for a six-year limitation period. Uh, which was extended in, in cases of mistake uh, to six years following the time when the taxpayer could have discovered the, uh, the, the, the mistake. So structurally, that was a very similar situation to the one we have here. Yeah. I mean, it was the statutory version of Section 32, yeah. but in pretty much the same words. Yeah. And again, I think it, another parallel was that there was an announcement that the law was going to be changed retrospectively to the date of the announcement, yeah. which again is exactly what happened in this case. Yeah. And, and, and there's no doubt that, um, and in, in this case, and in um, the, 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 the case in the test claim in um, uh, the FII um, 320 case, uh, the effect of the legislation uh, was, to, was to take away, uh, was to impose the time bar on existing claims, the result of which that the claimants lost their claims. Yes, and on day one they had a limitation period with a Section 32 type extension, and on the next day it had gone. Yeah. So that's precisely the same as our situation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's the same generically. Generically, but, I mean structure. But in yes. the. Um, well, how, it, how it will affect individual taxpayers yeah. depends on their individual circumstances. Yes. And that yeah. brings on back to the question whether one has to disapply on a sort of a, across the board basis or whether one can do it on a kind of tailor made. Basis. Yes, I, I, mean, I would say the tailor-made basis, tailor basis will follow uh, from the decision that the court takes as to what an adequate transitional period is, because after that, once you've decided... Without presupposing there is a transitional period, yes, whereas well, ex-hypothesis here, we don't have one, uh, more well, than there was an m &S. We have, what, what we do have is an adequate period um, but for for Jastel. Well, that's the happenstance point, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, it it's, it's, the, it's the effect of introducing um, the, a six-year limitation period that produced a clear mm. fixed period for a certain category of taxpayers. For other taxpayers, it took their rights away. But don't transitional periods have to be introduced as part and parcel of the new curtailment of the limitation period in order to... It, it is necessary uh, for them to be so introduced where the effect of introducing the new legislation is to re retroactively take away someone's rights. Well, uh, that may rather beg the question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, I think that's, 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 that's what... Maybe that's the key, yes, one so of the is, key that's, that's, points. This is absolutely, <laughs> this is the key point. So, is it? Yes. Uh, all of us saying at this stage is saying the ground... Sure, I'm sorry. I think it's... Um, you're yeah. quite right to take. Of course, we need to look at these cases. It, but it, it's, it's Grun Grundig um, makes it clear. Uh, we say that um, yes, once, once you've got to give effect to the principle of effectiveness. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to strike down the new rule completely for, in all in all circumstances. No. So um, the Marks and Spencer's case uh, was concerned with um, legislation mm. of uh, precisely the same. Character and kind yep. that we have uh, in, in the present uh, case. Uh, and the um, Marks and Spencer had uh, accounted for uh, value added tax uh, on various uh, transactions. The <coughs> facts of Marks and Spencer's are set out uh, in 12 to 
So I'm at tab tab ten uh, of the facts are four six four uh, of, of the bundle. Um, uh, briefly, uh, Marks and Spencer had been paying uh, VAT uh, on the sales of, of vouchers uh, up until the, the time that there had been a, a decision of uh, the Court of Justice in a case called Argos uh, in October uh, 1996. Okay. Uh, and the effect uh, in this case of the introduction of the three-year limitation uh, period uh, was that Marks and Spencer's uh, rights to claim for repayment of VAT, uh, which was paid more than uh, three years before October 96, when it, uh, the legislation was introduced, uh, were immediately time barred. Uh, and so Marks and Spencer uh, challenged that um, uh, legislation, uh, contending that it breached the principle of effectiveness. And the, the ground rules on the principle of effectiveness are set out in paragraph 34 onwards, page 467. Uh, and the starting Principle at par paragraph 34 uh, is that it uh, should be recalled at the outset in the absence of community rules on the repayment of national charges wrongly levied, uh, it is for the domestic legal system of each member state to designate the courts and tribunals having jurisdiction and to lay down the detailed procedural rules governing action for safeguarding rights which individuals derive from community law, uh, provided first that such rights are not less favourable than those governing uh, similar domestic <coughs> actions, the principle of equivalence, and secondly, that they do not render virtually impossible or excessively difficult uh, the exercise of rights conferred by community law, uh, the principle of effectiveness. So it's generally for the, for the member states to apply their own rules, uh, but that is subject to uh, the rules not rendering virtually impossible or excessively difficult, uh, the exercise of rights conferred by community law. That is the key question in this case. Uh, and on 35, uh, as regards the, the latter principle, uh, the courts held that in the interest of legal certainty, uh, which protects both the taxpayer and the administration, uh, it is com compatible with community law to lay down reasonable time limits for bringing uh, proceedings, that's a prelay, uh, such time limits are not liable uh, to render virtually impossible or excessively difficult uh, the exercise of the rights conferred by community law. Uh, in that context, the national limitation of a period of three years, uh, which runs from the date of the contested payment, appears to be reasonable. Moreover, it's clear from Aprile that national legislation curtailing uh, the period within which recovery may be sought of sums charged in breach of community law subject to certain conditions uh, is compatible with community law. Uh, first, it must not be intended specifically to limit the consequence to the judgment of the court to the effect that national legislation concerning a specific tax is incompatible with community law. Uh, secondly, the time set for its application must be sufficient uh, to ensure that the right to repayment is effective. Uh, in that connection, the court has held that legislation which is not in fact retro Effective in scope complies uh, with that condition. Uh, they then turn to the, uh, the legislation uh, in Marks and Spencers. Uh, that condition is not satisfied by national legislation such as that at issue in the main proceedings, which reduces from six to three years uh, the period within which repayment may be sought of that wrongly paid uh, by providing that the new time limit is to apply immediately to all claims made after the enactment of that legislation uh, and to claims made between that date and an earlier date, uh, as well as to claims for repayment made before the date of entry into force, which is still pending on that date. So there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a greater salvo was, was fired by the legislation in that case. Uh, whilst, uh, 38, whilst 
national legislation reducing the period within which repayment of sums collected for the breach of com community law may be sought is not incompatible uh, with the principle of effectiveness, mm. is subject to condition not only that the new limitation period is reasonable, but that the new legislation includes transitional arrangements uh, allowing an adequate period after the enactment of the legislation for lodging the claims for repayment uh, which persons were entitled to submit under the original legislation. Such transitional periods are necessary where the immediate application to those claims of a limitation period shorter than that which was previously in force would have the effect of retroactively depriving some individuals of their right to repayment. D just pausing yeah. briefly there. Um, I asked you earlier about why they didn't include an express transitional period in the 2003 legislation. Given that this case was decided in 2002, it's quite puzzling, really. Not that it matters for our purposes, but it is a bit puzzling. Yes, well, maybe, maybe they, they thought the, uh, the, the announcement in, in Parliament um, uh, may still have um, uh, done its work. Well, uh, and, and maybe they thought, well, there wasn't a real. I mean, the announcement in Parliament uh, was itself the cut-off date. Well, that's true. So, I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? And also, isn't it clear from the wording of Section 38? I mean, I know one doesn't always have to read these things literally, but it says the new legislation includes transitional arrangements, so they have to form part of the legislation. Uh, uh, that yes, that's what the ECJ mm -hmm. says. It is necessary, for, but then then they go to say, Hello, when yes. it is necessary for that to happen. Uh, and so um, one's got to distinguish where it's necessary and where uh, it's not. And it's, it's ne such transitional arrangements are necessary where the immediate application to those claims of a limitation period shorter than that which was in pre previously in force would have the effect of retroactively depriving some individuals of their right to repayment or of allowing them too short a period for asserting that right. That is what offends the principle of effectiveness. Yeah, but, well, all right. I, I know it's always difficult to know how far you should, as it were, read individual sentences in, in isolation. But on the face of it, I mean, it, it does seem completely clear, and it's laying down these two conditions which have to be satisfied. A, that the new limitation period is reasonable. That's, in our case, six years. But also that the new legislation, that's section 320, includes transitional arrangements, which it doesn't. Yes, but it also makes clear where it is necessary. But that doesn't detract from the need for the transitional arrangements to be included, does it? Uh, no, but, so, but, it, so, so it, it, but that means that where, um, where a person is affected hmm. by the absence of a transitional period uh, because they have had uh, their rights retroactively uh, taken away from them because um, the, um, the effect of the, of the new regime is to retroactively deprive them of the right they could have exercised. That person uh, can say, this legislation does not comply with EU law. It, it offends the application of this section to me, offends the principle of effectiveness. I've been deprived of my, my right Mm. This seems to be consistent with a, with a more fundamental underlying general principle of community law, which has been expressed in different ways, but it's really to do with the quality of law. Uh, sometimes it's called the principle of legal certainty, mm. but it's really, it seems to me, paragraph 38, the sentence my Lord drew attention to, is really just reflecting a fundamental principle of community law, which is that if you're going to change the law, you've got to say so, so everyone knows where they stand. So it's about the rule of law. Uh, I, that, that can't depend on how it then affects a particular individual, because either the legislation does or does not include transitional arrangements. The, the principle of legal certainty is, is sort of dealt with slightly separately in the next next passage right. uh, by the uh, by um, uh, the, the court because the um, uh, the court says that the, the, 
the legislation, uh, the effect of the legislation yeah, yeah. here uh, was also to um, uh, offend the, the protection uh, of the I've, I've, I've read that. Uh, one of the problems in this area, and I don't mean it by way of criticism, is that different courts tend to use the same terms to mean slightly different concepts. What I'm getting at is legal certainty not in the sense of retrospectivity, legitimate expectations and so on, something much more fundamental, which is that if the state wants to affect citizens, it's got to announce things publicly, promulgate them formally in a law. Now, that seems to be what has been offended against it. You, you say, and you may be right, we'll have to consider the submission. You may be right that a de facto transitional period will suffice. But at first blush, that seems a bit curious, because one might expect there to be a promulgation of a major change in the law. Yeah, what, 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 what I would say is that um, insofar as one's looking at um, you know, the, the effect of curtailing a, um, an existing um, transitional period, uh, an existing limitation period, you bring in a, a shorter period. Mm. Now, the, the law says what the new limitation period is, and yes. the, law is, the law is clear on that. So citizens reading that know, know. what, yeah. their, what yeah. their rights are. Yeah, so a category of yeah, claimants so will, will have exactly. suffered yeah. from so, the... So if they, if, they are read, if they read the law on the day after royal assent, and if necessary take legal advice, you say, and you may be right, that whereas previously they might have thought, well, I've got another four years in which to bring my claim for repayment, now I know, because I've read the law, I've only got two years. But as long as you've got a reasonable period, you say that's good enough. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and I find support from that in the, in the next case, the Grundy. I'm sorry, can I let friend just read paragraph 39 as well? Uh, 39 um, says, in, in that connection, it should be noted that member states are required as a matter of principle to repay taxes collected in breach of, of community law, which is known as the, the San Giorgio uh, principle. Uh, and whilst the courts have acknowledged that, by way of exception to that principle, fixing a reasonable period uh, for claiming uh, repayment is compatible with community law, it is in the interest of legal certainty, as was noted in paragraph 35 hereof, uh, however, in order to serve the purpose of ensuring legal certainty, limitation periods must be fixed in advance. So um, we would say of that is that if a limitation period is introduced uh, so that it shortens hmm. a period, then uh, for someone like Jastel, the limitation period was fixed in advance. Hmm. It knew, it, uh, as from uh, the 8th of September uh, 2003, uh, that it had six years in which to bring its claims. Did that, did that make, was, was that sort of uncertain? No. Uh, did that sort of take away, sort of pull the rug out of Jazz Dill's, uh position, as it did in the claimants of Marks and Spencer's, and took away the right? No, it didn't. So yes. moving on to the, to the Grundy. Oh, just before you do yes. that, forgive me for going back to paragraph 40, that, that may help you. The, the actual answer the Court of Justice gives, and again, one bears in mind that one is not reading a statute, but nevertheless, I think what you would emphasize is the way in which they answer the question is that the retroactive effect was mm -hmm. to deprive individuals of any possibility of exercising. Yes. So you say, you, you accept that if on the facts of an individual case, the effect of introducing the new limitation period is indeed to deprive an individual of any possibility of exercising a right which they previously enjoyed, then to that extent, it does offend against yes. EU law. Yeah. But you say that's not the facts of Jazz Tell. Indeed. Grundig is at um, tag 11. Uh, is this a case where um, there are sort of transcribers? Or uh, there are transcribers. Actually, no one has raised the question of uh, breaks in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the afternoon, but 
it may well be that they would be wanted. Um, well, they're always um, welcome, but in Pontypridd, we, we do accept these over the You live with it. Well, if, if, if you're content to live with it, then um, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the facts uh, of Grundy are set out in the judgment uh, of the court uh, on page 480 of the bundle. It's a sim similar, uh, similar um, overall picture here. Uh, Grundig uh, made payments of consumption tax uh, in Italy uh, from January 1983 to December uh, 1992. Uh, and then uh, on the uh, 22nd of July 1993, Grundig uh, made a, a repayment uh, claim, uh, and the um, as is a common feature of, of these uh, cases, after the payments that um, uh, Grundig had made of the of the tax, um, but before uh, Grundig had made a claim, uh, the Italian government reduced the applicable uh, limitation uh, period. Uh, from five years uh, to, uh, to to three years. Um, so, um, paragraph three, those are the payments of tax. Uh, paragraph four um, is a reference to an earlier case um, where the court had held that the t consumption tax uh, in Italy uh, was was unlawful. Uh, and from paragraphs uh, eight, uh, uh, nine onwards, uh, we have the domestic sort of limitation uh, regime that applied in Italy. Generally, there was a, a ten-year uh, time limit, uh, but it was five years uh, for uh, for for tax, uh, and a specific five-year period in paragraph eleven for certain types of uh, customs over payments. Paragraph 12 that sets out a change in the, in the law that came into force on the 27th of January <coughs> 1991 uh, and essentially that um, uh, deemed the five-year uh, customs limitation period uh, to apply uh, to the, the claims that um, Grundig had brought and it reduced the period from uh, five years to three the um, final bit of the, um, the the law cited in the indented uh, part. Um, and the, the issue here uh, was whether um, the, the application uh, of that uh, limitation period to Grundig's claim brought in uh, July uh, 2003 uh, was um, breached the, the, the principle of e effectiveness. Well, was there, wasn't there a transitional period of 90 days? I mean, the reduction to three years was expressed to take effect as from the 90th day after the entry into force of this law, and yes. it may not yeah, be material. But for what it's worth, you do there have an express transitional period contained in the curtailing legislation itself. Yes. And I know they went on to say 90 days wasn't enough, but at least it was an effort. It, it was it was there. So, well, you know, will that make a difference? Um, I'll, I'll take you to the Fleming case where uh, Lord uh, Newberger says, "Well, um, th some of these cases were uh, talking about whether there was an inadequate transitional mm. period, and it, did that make a difference?" He asked, "Whether if you had um, an inadequate transitional period or no transitional period, and he didn't think that there was a difference." In principle, if an inadequate, if you have an inadequate transitional period or no transitional period, it's it's got to it's, be adequate, it's, otherwise it's, it's no, no use. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I um, so 
Um, but the, um, that it was in the, the context of that that the national court uh, had some some doubts as to whether um, this sort of ninety day period was uh, <coughs> effective or not. And the, the question um, uh, was that um, set, set out on page four eight three. question was tailored to, to the point um, uh, my lord raised that um, uh, is, is, is the provision uh, reducing the, the time limit from uh, five to three uh, um, uh, compatible with EU law uh, if it's um, uh, been introduced with this period of grace as it was described of, 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 of 90 days <coughs> And the court's analysis of, of that question um, is at paragraphs 30, 33 uh, to 41. Uh, so picking up at paragraph 33 on page 485, um, 33 and 34, uh, they sort of repeat uh, the Marks and Spencers uh, guidance that generally it's for the, for the member states <coughs> subject to the principle uh, of, of effectiveness. Um, 35, they, they expressly confirmed that a reduced limitation period uh, can be applied even where the tax was paid uh, before the measure was uh, introduced. Uh, nor does the principle of effectiveness present an absolute bar to the retroactive application of the new period for initiating proceedings that is shorter and, as the case may be, more restrictive for the taxpayer than the period previously applicable. And that is so where the ap such application concerns actions for the recovery of internal taxes contrary to community law, which have not yet been commenced uh, by the time the new period comes into force, and which relate to sums uh, paid whilst the old period uh, was still applicable. So there's no absolute bar in uh, changing um, of the limitation period, even though you've paid the tax before the announcement is made. Uh, they re restate the, uh, the, the principle um, of effectiveness uh, as articulated in Marks and Spencers at, at paragraph uh, 37. Uh, and, and in doing so, they, they repeat at C and D uh, the, the essential requirement that. Um, you start off uh, national legislation reducing the period within which return to sums collected in breach of community law um, may be thought is not incompatible with the principle of effectiveness, general position. Uh, this is subject to the condition not only that the new limitation period is reasonable, uh, but also that new legislation includes transitional arrangements allowing an adequate period after an enactment for the legislation for lodging claims uh, for repayment, which persons were entitled to submit under the original legislation, general rule. Such transitional arrangements are necessary uh, where the immediate application uh, to those claims of a limitation period shorter than that which was previously enforced would have the effect of retroactively depriving some individuals of their right uh, of repayment. So if you take away someone's right of repayment retroactively, uh, you've got to have a transitional uh, arrangement uh, to deal with that. Uh, so 38, thus the, the, the transitional period must be sufficient uh, to allow taxpayers who initially thought that the old period for bringing proceedings was available to them a reasonable period of time to assert their right of recovery in the event that under the new rules they would already be out of time. So that's, the, that's what must be done. Uh, uh, th this is the category of, of taxpayers who require uh, a transitional period. Uh, in any event, they must not be compelled to prepare their action with the haste imposed by an obligation to act in circumstances of urgency unrelated to the time limit on which they could initially account. Uh, then they sort of do the, the weighing up balance of what, what is um, uh, a, a, a reasonable period. And 39, a, a transitional period of 90 days prior to the retroactive application of a period of three years for initiating proceedings in place of a 10 or five year period is clearly insufficient. 
if an initial period of five years is taken as a reference, 90 days leaves taxpayers whose rights accrued approximately three years earlier in a position to, of having to act within three months, and they'd thought that, that almost another two years uh, were still uh, available. Now, where a period of 10 or five years for initiating proceedings is reduced to three years, the minimum transitional period required to ensure that rights conferred by community <coughs> law can, effectively, can be effectively exercised, and that normally diligent taxpayers can familiarize themselves with the new regime and prepare and commence proceedings in circumstance which do not comprise their chance of success, can be reasonably assessed uh, at, at six months. I mean, doesn't that paragraph really presuppose that you're going to find this transitional period in the legislation? And this is in explaining if the legislation gives you six months, then that will normally provide the average taxpayer with a sufficiently long period. Well, I think not. But it's, it, what, if we, we go to the next uh, paragraph, mm. that sort of clarifies it. But I think what they're saying in 40 is that um, we've explained uh, um, the circumstances in which a transitional period is, necess is, is necessary. And so now we're looking at, well, what is an adequate uh, transitional period? But what they say in 41 um, uh, is that, however, uh, the, the fact that um, the, the National Court has found that a transitional period fixed by its national legislature, such as that in issue in the main proceedings, is insufficient, uh, does not necessarily mean that the new period for initiating proceedings cannot be retroactively applied retroactively at all. So um, mm. the principle of effectiveness merely requires that such retroactive application should not go beyond what is necessary in order to ensure the observance of that principle. It must, therefore, be permissible to apply the new period uh, for initiating proceedings to actions brought after expiry of an adequate transitional period assessed at six months in a case such as the, the present, even where those actions concern the recovery of sums paid before the entry into force of the legislation laying down uh, the new period. So they've, they've explained in, in 37 the circumstances when the transitional, um, where, where the principal of effectiveness means that tran the transitional provision is necessary, and that is where the immediate application uh, to those claims of the shorter limitation period uh, would deprive the individuals of their right of repayment, and it goes up in a, a puff of smoke. But they make expressly clear that the fact that um, there is an inadequate or no uh, transitional uh, period uh, doesn't mean that you can't apply the new the new time limit uh, at all. You you simply uh, disapply it to the extent that the principle of effectiveness mm. is offended. You say that in our case, the judge fell into error because he effectively struck a line through the legislation. For all cases, yes, he disapplied it in the sense that this is not the law of the land anymore. I, indeed, I mean, we would say his error went further because because he said it all depended on whether you knew oh, yes, you yes. had a claim or uh, not. Uh, but because of that, I mean, he he considered that you couldn't have a transitional period. I mean, mm. he, he said that it, it wouldn't have done Jazz Tell any good to have had a transitional period because even if it had a transitional period, he wouldn't have known. That they had to bring their claim because the, 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 the device that he thought existed was that um, uh, you were applying a, 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 um, a, a new period to someone who didn't know they had a right. So he went further than that, but he certainly did have the effect of going well beyond uh, paragraph 41. The, the, the knowledge bit confuses the issue quite a yes. lot. I mean, if you go back to paragraph 38, the transitional period must be sufficient to allow taxpayers who initially thought that the old period was available to them. Um, well, obviously, if you're uh, somebody who's made a payment in 2000, um, uh, uh, but don't realize that there's been a mistake, well, you're not going to be making any such calculation at all. No. Um, you could be in that situation if you'd made your payment in 
1990, you'd woken up to the fact that there was a mistake and were banking on, relying on Section 32. But with our sort of case, yeah. you're not going to be making that sort of calculation. I think that the language is sort of reasonably diligent uh, taxpayers. It, it's looking at a more in abstract terms. That have, did you have a right that, um, had you known about, you could have pursued? And was that right taken away from you by the um, by the, 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 the change time limit, if it was, um, uh, so that you were placed in a, um, a normally diligent taxpayer sort of who was aware of that would was placed in an excessively difficult position by the, by the new rules. And you can't apply that, that new time limit to him because it's, the, it's, um, uh, it's contrary to the principle of effectiveness. But yeah. um, it's, not, it's not an all or nothing thing, paragraph 41 uh, tells us. Um, and the answer given in answering the referred question at 42, you, you would submit, um, supports that submission. Because they again seem to focus on the application, the retroactive application of a time limit. Yes. And they refer to the claimant. Yes. So not no, it's, um, for everyone. And um, we say that's sort of consistent with the the general, the general policy. This is for um, time limits uh, for for national courts um, uh, to do. It's for the national legislation. Um, uh, so, and save and so far as the national legislation um, is incompatible with the principle of effectiveness, uh, then it it applies. And the fact that it um, uh, that it 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 has the it, there is an inadequate transitional period, uh, so it does have the effect of, re of removing uh, some taxpayers' rights. It doesn't mean that you can't apply it uh, at all, uh, and you can apply it even where the tax has been paid uh, before the, the legislation mm -hmm. came into force. Uh, and so we we say that. Um, yeah, that very much sort of supports um, the, the approach taken by the Chancellor in the, in the Class 8 uh, case uh, and um, is, is inconsistent with the, the judge's decision in, in the present case. Um, and the final, the final case um, uh, to consider briefly is, of course, the, the decision in... Uh, FII, which looked at section 320. Uh, that's at uh, paragraph uh, tab 13. And at, um, the, this was a Test uh, claim in the, um, uh, the, the franked investment income uh, litigation, uh, which had to address uh, section 320, uh, and um, the test claimant uh, for the case before the um, Court of Justice was a company called Aegis, uh, and that set out at um, paragraph 17 of the the judgment on page 527. Uh, and you'll see the unusual um, uh, facts of this case. Aegis um, uh, were looking to recover payments made more than six years uh, before issue, Aegis issued uh, its proceedings. And then on uh, paragraph 18, uh, the court says that <coughs> consequent on the decision uh, in an earlier case, um, which has looked at the incompatibility of the UK um, tax legislation, Aegis, on the 8th of September uh, 2003, uh, introduced a, a claim for restitution uh, on the basis of, of 
Time Warp Benson in order to reclaim ACT uh, paid there not due over the period from 1973 uh, to 1999. So uh, this is essentially Marks and Spencer's uh, case. Uh, here, here's Aegis. Uh, it had uh, paid tax. It had a, a right to reclaim that tax uh, going back to 1973 uh, on the 7th of uh, September uh, 2003. Uh, but on the 8th of September, it woke up and found that it had lost those rights completely. It lost its right uh, to repayment uh, for the periods in which it was, was claiming. Um, and as night follows day, um, the court applied the Marks and Spencer's reasoning uh, and said, uh, no. Now, what was, the, what was the revenue arguing about? Um, they were not seeking to re repeat any of the arguments um, uh, in, in relation to um, the principle of effectiveness. What they were saying, um, this probably goes back to uh, my Lord's sort of question earlier, why, why, why did the, um, the, the government introduce Section 320? The revenues argument in uh, this case was that uh, the principle of effectiveness was not engaged in this case because of the unique features of the domestic system of remedies. Um, a company like Aegis had various rights under UK domestic law, English law. It had a, um, a, a Woolwich claim. It had a, an entitlement to uh, uh, reclaim unlawfully levied tax. Uh, and the revenue and the United Kingdom here were saying, well, under our regime, uh, Aegis had a repayment remedy with a six-year time limit uh, that satisfies um, the principle of effectiveness because Aegis <coughs> has this uh, remedy um, uh, and therefore it had an effective legal remedy. And by providing Aegis with an effective legal remedy, the United Kingdom had sufficiently done its work uh, in protecting Aegis's EU law rights. Now, on top of that, as a matter of domestic law and the developments of the case law, um, the United Kingdom also, English law also gave um, Aegis a mistake-based remedy uh, with a, uh, a more generous time limit. Um, it wasn't required by EU law to give that additional remedy. It's something that just arose under domestic law. And so it was not contrary to EU law to take away that remedy, to, to um, shorten the time limit, because the principle of effectiveness was always uh, engaged, uh, so it was always um, uh, respected by the Woolwich claim. So that was, that was the argument in, in this case. And that argument was rejected. The, the court said, well, um, no, um, it's... Um, uh, the case law in Marks and Spencers says means what it says, uh, that if you have a, um, a, a right to recover unlawfully levied tax, uh, then uh, in order to remove that right, you can't, um, uh, you, you, you can't just take it away in a puff of smoke. So, it, it, so that's, that's why it was, uh, um, the case was argued. But it, it, it doesn't uh, detract in any way from the, uh, the principles as explained in both Marx and Spencer's and in, in Grundy. So th those, those are the three main um, uh, European law cases on, on, the, on the essential question that you've, uh, you have to decide. The 
there's, there's one further European law case I was proposing to show you, which is just a caterpillar case, which, which just touches on the on the on the concept of of, of knowledge. Um, uh, we, we say that it follows from the, the principles of um, that the, the cases that we've looked on uh, establish, in particular, uh, the principle of effectiveness. That it's essentially looking at do the national rules make the exercise of your rights um, uh, impossible? And ha having a, simply having a time limit uh, that uh, comes into force, and because you don't know about your rights, that takes all your rights away, does not offend the principle uh, of effectiveness. That's just the, the national rule uh, operating uh, within the concept of the principle of legal certainty uh, and within the autonomy of the member states to provide a, uh, a, a, a rational system. Um, so the fact you don't know your um, or should be irrelevant. Uh, and Caterpillar was a case where a, a taxpayer was saying, well, we didn't know about this, this judgment. Um, and um, the case sort of confirms that well, that's, that doesn't matter. Uh, it, was a, it was a VAT uh, case. Um, it concerned the application of a, of a time limit uh, for the repayment of, of VAT, um, where um, as often happens in these these cases, after a court uh, decision um, relating to um, the, 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 the VAT treatment of the of the supplies in question, uh, the, the the company realised that it had overpaid uh, VAT. Um, so, paragraph three, uh, it was the, the relevant VAT rule was that of exemption for insurance uh, transactions. Um, um, Caterpillar was a, a company that provided uh, leasing uh, services uh, in Poland uh, and it had arranged uh, insurance uh, for its customers uh, and it charged them uh, the costs of, of that insurance and treated them uh, as exempt. So uh, paragraph 3 sets out the basic rule that um, insurance services are exempt from uh, VAT. Uh, paragraph uh, 15 and 16 uh, make it clear that what um, uh, Caterpillar uh, had been doing was uh, arranging insurance for its, for its customers and exempting those contributions from VAT. Uh, but then at six, paragraph 16, uh, there was a decision of the Polish court uh, which held that um, someone like Caterpillar should have been charging VAT uh, on, the on the, that element of the, uh, of the insurance services that it um, uh, um, provided to its customers. Uh, and so uh, paragraph 16, um, uh, following an inspection from the, from the Polish authorities, uh, Caterpillar uh, corrects its invoices and pays uh, the VAT on the insurance uh, contributions. Uh, that was in 2010. Uh, and then after uh, there was a, a, high, a Court of Justice decision in PGZ leasing, uh, which says that um, uh, no, um, these services were exempt. So, so Caterpillar had been told by the national authorities to pay up the, uh, the VAT. Uh, the court comes along and says, well, no, it, it's exempt. Uh, Caterpillar then bring a, a, a claim, uh, and um, lo and behold, the, there was a limitation period, uh, which um, uh, time-barred uh, Caterpillar's uh, claim, or part of the, the claim. And what Caterpillar uh, argued was that the um, yeah, the, that limitation period shouldn't apply because uh, it believed it would just be futile to uh, to challenge the, uh, the, the the payment. Uh, and that um, that question was dealt with in the context of the principle of uh, effectiveness. Uh, which the, the court uh, 
picks up at paragraph 41, having to explain the, the Marks and Spencers principles. And at 46, it says it's therefore necessary to examine whether in the circumstances such as those issues um, in, in this particular case, uh, the, the taxable person is, is regarded as having been prevented from exercising his rights before the, uh, the national courts, i.e. because of the time limit. Um, and then at 48, um, it says that Caterpillar claimed that the awareness of the judgment of the highest administrative court in, in Poland, which was unfavourable to it, together with the announcement of an imminent tax review, influenced its decision to pay uh, the, the, to the tax authorities uh, the amounts it, corresponding to the arrears. Uh, Caterpillar expressed that it was convinced of the futility in that context of contesting the compatibility with EU law of the collection of VAT relating to the insurance uh, costs connected with lease, with lease contracts. However, the subjective conviction not to be able to act other than by paying the VAT uh, relating to the insurance costs connected with the lease contracts cannot be treated as an objective impossibility uh, to act otherwise. Uh, in this case, Caterpillar had the possibility of refusing to pay the tax arrears uh, since it initially considered that those insurance costs were exempt from VAT and to contest any order uh, for payment by way of a legal action, or to pay the tax arrears and bring an action before a, a national court to obtain reimbursement of the undue payment within the limitation period, uh, without waiting for a, a possible uh, interpretation by the court of the provisions of the VAT directive. Uh, however, it must be noted that Caterpillar did not invoke any of those possibilities. So, it the fact that Caterpillar didn't know didn't mean that the um, it was objectively impossible under the national regime for Caterpillar to, to bring its its claim. It was possible. And that's all that there needs to be. There needs to be a possibility. Your, your knowledge, subjective knowledge, of whether you've got a right to claim or not is neither here nor there. And in the present case, we would say that JASDO had, had the possibility of not paying the, uh, the VAT or the possibility of uh, paying the tax and bringing an action uh, for repayment. Um, JASDO has done that now, but um, we say it's too late. Uh, but JASDO's subjective state of awareness uh, of its legal rights um, is, is not the question. The only question is whether the, the national rule made it impossible or excessively difficult for Jasdell to bring its, its claim. Um, can I then turn to the, uh, the decision of the, the House of Lords in Fleming, because that's a case which is um, strongly relied on uh, by uh, the uh, friend, uh, and really it was, it was the case that was relied on uh, below. Uh, the, interpret um, the submissions from Jastel below as, as relying on the hidden retrospectivity point. That was, that was more an addition that the, uh, the learned judge um, uh, brought, uh, brought in. But um, what, uh, what um, uh, Jastel says about uh, the Fleming case, which is in Authorities Bundle 1, Tab, tab two uh, is that the House of Lords has has, has said uh, that if there is um, uh, a provision that doesn't have a, a transitional provision, then it must be ineffective for, for all for all purposes. Uh, and we say that's not what this uh, case decides uh, at all. Um, this was another. Um, VAT case concerning a shortened limitation period. Uh, we've seen in Marks and Spencers uh, that um, the national legislation uh, did um, curtail an existing period and, and brought in a, a, a three-year 
uh, time limitation period. Uh, that was concerned with the ordinary uh, case of Marks and Spencers who were um, uh, reclaiming uh, value-added tax, uh, which uh, they had um, uh, they had charged uh, and paid over to the to the revenue. The difference between uh, the Fleming uh, litigation uh, was that it concerned claims for input tax. Um, now, a slightly, slightly different regime applied um, in that that registered traders are entitled to deduct input tax, so uh, the VAT that's been charged them against their liabilities to pay that to, uh, to, to the customs um, every, every quarter. Uh, and if by an oversight um, or, or mistake a trader fails to claim an amount of, uh, of input tax on Turn, uh, then they will either um, account to the revenue for more tax than they should, because uh, they haven't deducted enough, or possibly if they are a, a repayment trader, because they make sort of zero rated uh, supplies um, uh, and, and ordinarily actually claim payments of, of money from the revenue on their quarterly returns, then in that case they would be claiming less money from the, uh, the revenue. Um, so, if we look at the, uh, the, the facts of, of, of the, the present case, uh, we had two types of two traders that uh, had made uh, claims for under underclaimed input tax. And the taxpayer in the headnote on page forty, it's just really the, um, the, the first sentences of both of those paragraphs that set out the essential facts of Fleming and Condé Nast. Uh, Fleming uh, had made a, a claim in October 2000. Sorry, I haven't kept up with you. Where? Oh, in the... Um, uh, I'm in uh, yes, Authorities no, Bundle Design. Yes. Just on looking at the head notes. Yes. Um, just, just, uh, just to establish when the, when the claims were, were made. Um, in, uh, so Mr. Fleming had made a claim in October 2000 for repayment of input value-added tax paid on the purchase of, of three cars uh, in 1989 and 1990. Uh, and the taxpayer in the second case made a claim in June 2003 uh, for repayment of input value-added tax in respect of expenditure on staff entertainment expenses <coughs> between April 1973 uh, and April 1997. Um, so, um, if Mr. Fleming's claim was uh, in, entirely wiped out uh, by this by a new uh, limitation period, uh, and Condé Nast's was was largely wiped out by the uh, new limitation period, uh, there was a um, had been a, a a dispute as to what the correct limitation period was uh, under the d domestic. Uh, regime, um, I think Lord Hope uh, explains um, uh, the relevant limitation periods in paragraphs two uh, onwards of, of his decision on his speech on page 44. Um, and before the House of Lords, it, it had become sort of common ground uh, that input tax claims were, uh, under domestic law, uh, also subject to a, a, a three-year limitation period, uh, the same as output tax claims. Uh, that the three-year limitation period uh, was, um, was, was contained in Regulation 29.1a. Uh, of the value-added tax uh, regulations, that's uh, referred to paragraph three um, of, um, of Lord Hope's speech, uh, and that had been introduced uh, from the first of May, with effect from the first of May, nineteen ninety-seven. Uh, and the difference between um, uh, the 
Section 291A, Regulation 291A, uh, three-year cap. It was actually introduced a, a cap in circumstances where there had been no time limit whatsoever uh, before. Um, there was a curious sort of feature of the, um, of the, of the legislation was that there was a time limit under Section 80, uh, which applied to output tax claims, and that was what Marks and Spencer uh, was concerned with. So that had been uh, shortened. Um, the revenue uh, had said, well, input tax claims are also within Section 80, um, but in a, um, a, a decision of the Court of Appeal in, in the University of Sussex, the Court had decided, well, actually, no um, input tax claims are outside Section 80 completely. So that meant there was no time limit uh, at all. Yeah. Um, so the purpose of Regulation 291A uh, was to, um, uh, was to introduce um, immediately a, um, a, a three-year time uh, cap. And so the effect, again, of the introduction of Regulation 291A uh, was to remove retrospectively um, both uh, Mr. Fleming and Emily Nast's right uh, to reclaim income tax, input tax, uh, paid more than uh, three years uh, before 1st of uh, May 1997, without any transitional period. And on the face of it, therefore, Regulation 291A uh, suffered from the same vice as um, uh, the Marks and Spencer uh, three-year cap in Section 80 of the uh, Value Added Tax Act. Um, Mr. Fleming had a right to claim his uh, input tax the day before uh, 1st of May 1997, but it went up in a puff of smoke uh, on that date. Is, is that, if, if I go back to the Condé Nast claim, um, that staff entertainment expenses between 1973 and April 1997. So for, for, for some of that went up in a puff of smoke, and for a, another part of it, it didn't. And so with the 1997 payment, it would be similar to this case? Would it? Yes. Uh, but the arguments in this case were very different. Yeah. What the revenue was seeking to argue uh, in this case was that for all cases, uh, um, for Mr. Fleming, Condé Nast, uh, that it was open uh, to the national court to sort of retrospectively read in uh, an appropriate period of disapplication, um, and various per periods were sort of uh, suggested by the revenue. And if one did that now, if one retrospectively uh, read in period of disapplication, that would make the entire UK legislation compatible with EU law so that the provision as now read by the, by the courts uh, could be relied on by the revenue uh, to preclude all of the claimant's claims. Uh, so even, in particular, the claims that had been retrospectively removed by Regulation 21A. So the revenue was saying, well, we did retroactively take away your right to a claim on the 1st of May 1997. So you woke up on that day thinking, well, I'm now out of time. Uh, there was no transitional period, but the courts can be entitled to read in a transitional period and say, well, yes, here, here we will now read in that there was this six-month period in which you could have brought your claim. That satisfies the principle of effectiveness. <coughs> and so, um, lo and behold, you did not bring your claim within that retrospectively read in transitional period, and therefore your claim is out of time. And as Lord Newberger said, well, that was just doing lip service to the principle of effectiveness. The, re 
Revenue were, were, were arguing in, in this case that um, even though uh, in, in Marx and Spencer uh, and Grundig uh, said that it was necessary to have a transitional period uh, where he would retroactively uh, remove someone's right uh, to a claim, we can cure that by reading in ex post facto a transitional period so that it, it's, it's there, uh, even though nobody knew it was there uh, at the time, uh, and apply the new time limit, which the court has sort of read in with this transitional period, to claims that have been retroactively taken away. So, so just to understand the similarities and differences, if we take the Fleming claim, where the cars had been bought in 1989 and 1990, come whatever it is, 1996, 1997, uh, it would have appeared to the taxpayer uh, that there was no possibility of a claim at all. It was shut out already. Yeah. Um, with an April 1997, or, or payment expenses incurred up to April 1997, on the other hand, it would have appeared to a taxpayer that he had three years. But that you say is the point that wasn't. Um, yeah, that, that, I mean, the, the, uh, that wasn't. There was no sort of separate argument on no. based on that um, distinction. The revenue was saying, look, this transitional period can be read in, and if it does, it makes the, sec the, the regulation compliant with EU law. It's going, it had a. It now has got a transitional period, uh, and um, you didn't bring your claim with it. But yeah. but the critical distinction. Is that insofar as the revenue, what the revenue was seeking to do, uh, was to use that against all claims, and um, including uh, the claims uh, which were uh, were time barred, and, and we say, well, yeah, we accept that argument now, and the um, years have passed, uh, is, is, is not capable of being made, and the uh, the Lords were were right to uh, to to reject it. But is it your submission that one can read in a transitional period in the present context, but only for some claims, including jazz terms? Yes, I mean, saying that we can, we, you do not need to, uh, there is a period hmm. um, uh, which the, the court can uh, take a, a, a view on, and which um, uh, the, the, the legislation. Um, should, can and should be disapplied uh, insofar as it applies to claims that uh, have been made uh, excessively uh, difficult or practically impossible to be made. Uh, but thereafter, the claims uh, that <coughs> are made um, do not uh, fall within that category, and, and therefore the court um, does not and should not um, disapply Section 320. So although on the face of the legislation, as promulgated, there's no reference to transitional provisions. I think your submission is that if um, a taxpayer had gone to a legal advisor and asked on the relevant date, what is the time limit? How long have I got? That the answer would have been, uh, you've got a year, you've got, a you've got two years, um, it's, it's less than you had previously, but nevertheless, you've got some time. So you say that's sufficient promulgation by the state of what the new time limit is. Yes. But where you can't, what, what you, you can't do is read in a transitional period mm. where mm. the person has lost their right. They've been retroactively deprived of their right. The effect of the legislation is it's yes. gone because yes. they... They, they, they don't know. They, yes. they, they'd ask their advisor and say, well, look, yeah. time bar. One of the difficulties that I'm having with this, and I'm sorry, sorry, please don't take this out of order at all, but at some point both you and Mr. Grzynski may want to come back to this. I'm wondering, speaking only for myself, whether EU law has any concept similar to what we find in ECHR law about uh, the different elements of what a law is. That they talk about the quality of law. Now, to some extent, there's an overlap because both regimes talk about 
legal certainty in the sense of uh, the law being drafted in such a way that it's reasonably predictable, if necessary, by taking legal advice. That's to do with predictability. But there's a different element, certainly in ECHR law, possibly, possibly not in EU law, which is about foreseeability. And, and uh, certainly in the ECHR system, as I understand it, the, uh, the, the law has to be accessible in the sense that you have to be able to look it up, not guess. You, don't, you shouldn't have to guess. I think they would say, maybe I'm wrong, I think they would say, you shouldn't have to guess that there's a transitional period. The law should say so on its face. Which I suppose you say what it did. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it gave you six years. I, I, mean, I, I would say that the, mm. um, the, the way that I, I understand EU law um, deals with that mm. concept is through the, the general principles. Mm. And the, the, there is certainly an overlap in, in what you say and, and the principle of, of legal certainty. Yes. And there's the, re the repeated... Um, statements from, from the court as far as limitation periods are concerned, they've got to be fixed in advance. You, you can't have a sort of, uh, a sort of discretionary um, uh, limitation period. But um, as, as the court in Grundy said, that it's not an all or, all or nothing uh, thing. That if, if you do have a, 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 a defective legislation because it didn't have the um, the, um, the, the the stated um, transitional period, then there is a, a category of persons mm. who will be adversely affected by the sort of le legislative uncertainty and wouldn't know what to do. So um, the person that's actually got their right and has lost their right can't be expected to sort of think about, well, how are the courts cure this defect in the law but the person that doesn't lose their rights automatically uh, is placed in a new legal regime which he's entitled to find out about under the new legal regime then that person is in, in a different category and so that's, that's why I would say that the um, that paragraph 41 in Grundy the, the court sort of recognises that distinction I'm sure you're going to come to this, but just so I'm clear. So suppose a payment is made in August 1997, so more than six years before the new regime comes in. Yeah. The six years would run out before that new regime comes in, but we suppose that uh, the taxpayer couldn't with reasonable diligence have found out about the mistake until sometime in the 1997 to 2003 period. But I, I would say that if, if that's introducing the sort of state of mind of the, of, of, of the taxpayer. Yes, um, so on an objective basis for this purpose. Um, he, he, if he had a right. He had a right. Uh, when, when the new regime comes in in 2003, his, his uh, ability to pursue his claim founded on section 32 and there the new regime has no effect on him uh, he, he, he has a he has a right on the sort of um, the next morning to uh, on, on the day before <laughs> to, to bring his to bring his claim yes yeah and that right's taken away and yeah. uh, so so it, in the case of somebody who has found out yeah or could have found out between 1997 and 2003, he has his right taken away, uh, but the legislation won't bite. He still has six years from when he found out or could have found out. If he, if he, if, if his right was, um, uh, if if his right was taken away um, uh, on on eighth um, of September 2000. Uh, and the effect of that was that uh, 
he, uh, he, 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 he lost, either lost his right absolutely on that day, or, or lost it you know, within the next um, three months, four months, uh, then um, the, for him, a transitional period was necessary. And the absence of a transitional mm. period means that the legislation is defective. And that has the consequence that he gets the six years he would otherwise have had. Yes. And equally, if he's made his payment in August 1997, and he couldn't have found out about his mistake and didn't until 2008, he gets six years from 2008. Well, that's depending on what the, what the laws of dis discoverability. But, but I'm, I'm feeding that in, assuming yeah. that for the sake of argument that he didn't find out and couldn't have found out until 2008, he would have till 2014 to bring his claim. Yes, I think that's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I, effectively you're saying if you have the benefit of the Section 32.1c, you have, you have the full benefit of it. If, if it's been removed in a situation where... Um, you haven't had any opportunity to do anything about it. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Um, I mean, that, that seems to be consistent mm. with. Uh, yes. That w w where the court has said it's it's that that's the circumstance where it's it's necessary. Where the, uh, the, the um, but, and so, so to that extent, you're not doing any. I mean, you're 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 not you're not tinkering with the six-year element of the section thirty-two one C or accepting it's there in toto for those. For whom it's preserved. Yeah. I mean, one way of looking at it is it's really it's for that category of taxpayer, there's only ever been a single relevant limitation period, which is six years extendable under Section 32. Um, but, and the answer to the question is going to turn on um, it's not something you can go and look up, it's something you have to go and take advice about because. You're not going to find any written transitional provisions because there aren't any. No, but um, uh, but, 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 but but essentially, you you it, it's for the, the court mm. will, will decide. Well, this um, brings us back to the discussion we were having earlier about how much does it matter, if at all, that the this sort of the, the tailor-made approach is one which is not something you can you can go and find in a text of a, something you can look up on the internet. So, so I would say that the answer to that is, is given by paragraph 41 in mm. Grundy, where, mm. where the court you know, didn't yeah. need to expressly s says what, the, what, what, what there, that there is a limit mm. yes. on the disapplication yes. that, that's, yep. that's made. And, and that. that seems to be uh, it's fundamentally consistent with the, the underlying principle that's being expressed uh, namely that of effectiveness, mm. uh, that general, your legislation uh, is up to the member states, provided that it complies with the principle of effectiveness. So if you've given someone uh, a reasonable time to, to make their claim under the new regime, mm. uh, then you haven't made their, their position um, practically impossible or excessively difficult. So no. then EU law doesn't require the national court to strike down the legislation. Does so your thesis, with, with which Mr. Hoff, Mr. Grzynski obviously will disagree, yeah. but your thesis is when you don't blue pencil legislation, um, so where there would be no incompatibility with EU law, uh, suppose it's simply a domestic context, then plainly Section 320 stands. Equally, Section 320 stands uh, in relation to payments made after September 1997, after September 2003, yes. um, uh, uh, you say with payments made in the period between 1997 and 2003, still you don't blue pencil, you look at the application to the particular individual. Mm -hmm. Mr. Krasinski presumably says, well, the revenue didn't miss any trick in Fleming. The fact is that with that category of payment, that's that. There being no transitional period. Yeah, it's all or nothing. Mm. Yeah. Um, and um, yes, we're yes. looking at the um, uh, the, the <coughs> payment made after um, in the decision of this court in the in the Leeds decision.
sufficient to recruit. If there is a payment made the day after, um, then it doesn't defend the principle of effectiveness because um, that's all about the, the, um, the vice of, of the retrospective application of legislation is it takes um, people's rights to claim away. But if you've got um, a reasonable period in which to bring your claim, you've got a, a, a shortened limitation period, but it's, it's still reasonable. Yeah, but the, the but the important thing about Fleming is that the, the the revenue were arguing for an outcome which which were not arguing for in in this case. They were arguing for the outcome uh, that by reading in the transitional provision, um, you could um, apply you could then apply your, your new time limit uh, against the category of payment such as Mr. Fleming. Uh, who was um, immediately out of time by the introduction of uh, Regulation 291A. So effectively, the, the argument was the court could step in to do what the legislature had failed to do. Yeah. Um, and that one can see all sorts of constitutional reading reasons, if no other, as a very unattractive argument. Yeah, the Lord Scott. Says Lord so Scott that. in particular. <laughs> um, and perhaps Lord yeah. Newberger too, I think, yeah. probably made the same point. Yeah. But, but more fundamentally, it went against it, it went against um, the, uh, you know, the, the the reasoning of, of Marks and Spencer is that um, you, you you've got to have a transitional well, yeah. because of this because of this effect if you don't. I mean, the trouble is, we it might be said, well, you're really asking us to do the same thing. You're asking us to decide now what a reasonable <laughs> transitional period would be. Um, uh, yes, but, but 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 the reason why I say I'm entitled to it is because. The, the case law of Marks and Spencers and Grundy make it clear where the transitional period is necessary. Um, uh, the circumstances in which a, a transitional period is necessary is it, precisely to um, protect those people whose rights are taken away by the, the new well, I mean, that's a statement of a category of people for whom it is necessary. Yeah. It doesn't follow that that is, so to speak, an, a, an exhaustive right. statement right. of all those who ought to have the benefit of these doctrines. I, I can't do more than rely on paragraph. Of course you can't. And it, that also, and it's not just a question of effectiveness. I mean, the other important principles of EU law engaged are certainty and legitimate expectations. Yes. Um, and certainty one would think, and this very much chimes with what my Lord, Lord Justice Singh was putting to you, certainty might well chime with the human rights principle. You've got to have something you can actually go and look up in the legislation which introduces the curtailment. If not, you're left in an unsatisfactory state of affairs where the law requires expensive recourse to lawyers and difficult hypothetical questions being examined when it should be something you can get a yes or no answer to just by looking for a fixed period. But, but my, my Lord, I, I, I would, uh, although, although paragraph 41 turns up in the, in the passage dealing with effectiveness, mm. the, the, the court would have had in mind that what it was saying there was, was a um, generally uh, compatible with the other EU law principles, and, and in particular because I think what they were were, uh, were articulating is that, uh, that if leg they're assuming that the legislation that you know, you've introduced the new time limit uh, is otherwise uh, com compatible uh, because it does lay down uh, a time limit that's fixed in, in advance, um, and if it's done that, um, the court is saying, well, that's that, that's all right after, and in particular after a a, 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 a reasonable. Um, uh, after an adequate period, so the, the court is re requiring the national courts to, uh, to to undertake the task um, that, that we're inviting you to, to, to take um, of determining what the adequate uh, transitional period would be, uh, and then um, applying it uh, uh, to the to the categories of, of claimant that fall within it.
uh, we wrote um, a, a, a plan. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> perhaps I can sort of take you to the um, judgment of, of Lord Newburger. Uh, Lord Hope and Lord uh, Carswell agreed with Lord Newburger. Um, Lord Scott agreed with um, some things of it that uh, Lord Newberg said, but took a very sort of different view as to the constitutional limitations of, uh, of, of, of the court, um, whereas Lord, Lord Walker um, took a slightly different approach uh, in that he said that um, uh, as far as uh, the Condé Nast uh, claim uh, um, was concerned, uh, as far as the Fleming claim was concerned, they, they would be sort of out of time. Yeah. That's the other way around. Oh, yeah. the, um, Condé Nast had um, just brought their claim too late. So, um, uh, if one looks at um, uh, the, the principles that uh, Lord Newberger uh, articulates at um, paragraph 79, uh, we find the, the principles that uh, we've taken. You two already. Uh, so over the, I think we've seen all those. And think about F that the adequacy of the period afforded <coughs> by the transitional period is to be determined uh, by reference to the principle of effectiveness and legitimate expectation. Sorry, can we just go back to E? Yes. Is that of some importance to your submission? Um, so that he, yes. there he's talking about <clears throat> the introduction of a retrospective time limit without a reasonable transitional provision. What do you do? National courts cannot enforce the retrospective time limit in relation to accrued rights, at least for a reasonable period. Yes. You say, he's not saying national courts now just ignore the domestic law as if it doesn't exist. And 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 uh, disapply in all cases. Um, you've got to roll your sleeves up and ask yourself what is a reasonable period, even though the legislature hasn't expressed one. Yes, I'm, I'm grateful. I had that highlighted and skipped past it. Well, no, I, that may be a yeah. misreading. No, of no, it, no, but that, is that, that a, is that, that a possible reading? That, of that, it? that 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 is the reading that that um, I think is the correct. He refers there to also logic as implying that would provide authority for that proposition as stated, including the at least for a reasonable period qualification. Um, I mean, perhaps at some point you might have a look at also logic just to see if it throws any yeah, so we'll, we'll throws any it. light on that. Yeah. And over the page at G, he, in, in, I think it's, yes, it's in light of um, that, uh, he says at G that it's primarily a matter for the national courts uh, to decide whether the length of a transitional period I is adequate. That, of course, presupposes you have something that's properly characterized as a transitional yes, period. Yes, exactly. Well, there's, there's that. There, there, it comes in at two stages. There's, yes. There's yes. Whether you've got one, and then there's the paragraph 41. <laughs> Ascertainment that needs to take place as the period of this application, which um, uh, Lord Newberger um, uh, mentions at little j there. The remedy would be yeah. normally to disapply, perhaps only for a period, uh, the operation of retrospective application of the new time limit to claims based on accrued rights. Uh, see Grundig 2, especially with regard to temporary disapplication, paragraph 41. Yes, and, and also we we have to note, don't we, H and I, because he's expressly yes. envisaging there a situation where there is an absence of a transitional period of adequate length. Yeah. But as he says, it's not automatically fatal. A 
what they didn't do in this case was then go on to read in a transitional period so as to defeat the claims which were made and were put out of time uh, by uh, this um, time limit. So that's presumably an appropriate moment to have a short yes. break. <laughs> uh, in which case, we'll uh, start again at 2 o'clock. Surprise.